So I've called this physical activity and exercise a lifespan approach to maintain health. A man much wiser than me, Hippocrates, back in, I think, around 300 or 400 BC, or Plato, I should say, um, commented, I think, a quote that's still very relevant, that lack of activity destroys the good condition of every human being, while movement and methodical physical exercise save it and preserve it. And, and this wise man pointed out that our bodies were made to move and that movement is really important for our health. If you look to what we know at the Australian level, at advice that the government provides all of us, we know that there are many, many benefits to staying active, physical activity. It's in quite small text along this side. It's things like if you're more active, it reduces your risk of getting diabetes, heart disease, it can help with weight, it can keep muscles strong. It can help you actually engage and get out and meet other people. It can help with some of the symptoms of mood and it can help thinking. And a wise colleague of mine, Professor Nora Shields from La Trobe University, really nicely summarised that as saying that physical activity helps us stay healthy, it helps us stay happy and it helps us stay smart. We know that it can help with memory and we know that it can help with concentration. So there's all sorts of benefits that all of us will experience from being active. If we look to the Australian guidelines for how active we should all be, these were recently revised and they suggest that broadly all of us, regardless of ability, could be aiming for around about 150 to 300 minutes of moderate intensity physical activity. So where you feel you're starting to work, your breathing's a little quicker, perhaps you can talk but you'd have trouble singing. We should all be doing muscle strengthening exercises a couple of days a week and trying to be active on most days. And really importantly, a really key part of that message is any physical activity is better than none. Now, we have no specific guidelines from our government for people with MS, but the Canadians pub published quite an interesting review and some guidelines from experts that suggesting that for people with multiple sclerosis in particular, they should be aiming towards 30 minutes of moderate intensive aerobic activity twice a week <coughs> and again some strength training and that those guidelines are something to aim for for fitness benefits for people who have mild to moderate disability with MS. So that's something thought to be helpful and that would benefit people. If we look to the Australian community as a whole, you'll all have seen public health messages to us all about being more active. We know from our, our really large health surveys that over 60% of Australians aren't active enough. If we look to some studies that have compared the activity of people who have MS to people who don't of around the same age, we know that more people with MS are less active and that most people with MS are not active enough to gain health benefits. I'm talking a little bit about physical activity and exercise and, and those words mean different things to us. We've been really focused on particular exercise programs for a while, but now we're much more interested in the landscape of broadly what physical activity is. So physical activity in, in the big circle is any activity that you're doing that gets your body moving, gets you breathing faster, getting your heart beating faster. So it might be things like gardening, sweeping the paths, doing housework, walking the kids to school, all of those activities across the day. Exercise is just a part of that. It's that subcategory that is planned, it's structured, it's repetitive, and you're doing it to improve or you maintain health. And it's just part of the big picture of physical activity that we're looking at as being important across the whole lifespan of all of us, whether we have MS or not. 
If we look to exercise and, and physical activity, there's been a really in, large increase in interest and a, many more studies going on about how exercise might be thought to be beneficial. There's a, a common tag frame and in fact an organisation again thinking could exercise be something that we should be prescribing exercise as medicine? If you look at the graph on the left, that's just simply me looking at the medical and, and physiotherapy literature and looking at the increased number of studies. Over towards me, it's the number of studies published in 1990 and over at the far side, it's 2015. So a really positive thing is that we know a lot more about how physical activity might be beneficial for people with MS and what to do. We also know a little bit more about what we don't know. What is encouraging is not only are there more studies, but the studies are higher quality. And that means that we can take groups of studies that have done the same thing and start to put the information together and get much clearer idea about what the strength of evidence is for us. We also are starting to look more carefully about why people don't exercise. 60% of Australians don't exercise or do enough. We need to think about what makes it harder and what makes it easier and what might make it harder or easier if you're living with a health condition like MS. We know from some work across a number of studies that it can be harder if you don't have access or the environment that you want to do exercise doesn't cater for you and your needs. We know really, really well that we don't give enough advice to you about what to do. And sometimes we give you confusing and conflicting advice, which can make it harder. We know that people experience personal barriers. Everyone's very individual, everyone's journey is, is different. Sometimes it might be fatigue. Sometimes it might be fear or apprehension about what will happen with exercise. We also know that there are some things that make it easier and that's important for us to learn from. So people who have access to the right environments or support to exercise find it easier. People who have a sense of achievement, who are able to find the right exercise for them, complete it successfully and get that real sense of warm fuzziness of when you feel you're doing something really positive for your health, the feeling of success and enablement. And again, that's important. One of the important studies or, or, or very recent work has pulled together a, a great deal of studies and we know absolutely convincingly now that exercise in multiple sclerosis is safe. We had probably had some concerns, we'd taken it easy, we'd been quite careful, but we know that it's safe. This is 26 studies involving 1,296 people and it's been shown there are no increasing relapses and no more adverse events. So exercise is safe. We also know that exercise can improve for people with MS, their balance. And again, Lisa referred to a, a really interesting study going on in Sydney at the moment where Fu Hong is exploring the ability of dance mats to actually increase someone's ability to step quickly and regain their balance. We know that balance and risk of falls improves and there's some evidence that exercise can help prevent falls. We know that exercise is good for walking ability. It can increase the walking speed of, some, of many people and how far they can walk. We have good evidence now that exercise can improve the symptoms of fatigue with small improvements for many people. We know that that's highly individual and we know we need to know more about the effect, but it can actually lead to improved fatigue symptoms in many people. And we know when looking at groups of people with neurological conditions like MS, that it can actually help with symptoms of depression and mood. So there's a huge range of benefits potentially for, for exercise and physical activity for people living with a condition like MS. There are all sorts of exercises that you can do. And often it's easier to kind of break them down into what they're targeting. 
So broadly, I tend to think of them as being something that is about aerobic fitness, that's getting your heart pumping and keeping it going. Strengthening exercises to keep the muscles strong, which we know is helpful for walking and balance. Balance exercises improve your ability to be able to control your balance or to step quickly. And flexibility, the, the ability to maintain comfortable ranges of movement and to avoid muscles becoming short. All of those activities we know are helpful. When we look for what the Canadian guidelines suggest are most helpful, we look to aerobic fitness and strengthening. But certainly there's a range of things that people can do that they can find helpful. We're often asked, I think as health professionals, what kind of exercise is best? And there's certainly lots of choices. And people need to choose what works for them at particular points in time and what they like. So it could be that you're sweeping and gardening at home. You could be going to the local gym. You might prefer to exercise on your own to a DVD. You might like classes, and this class is actually not people with MS, but actually people with Parkinson's. We did a, a recent trial looking at contemporary dance um, to improve health in people with Parkinson's, and that was the most fabulous exercise trial I've ever been involved with. Um, I have worked with people strengthening. I have worked with people with flexibility. I've never seen joy like I saw with people with dance. You can go anywhere. You can decide what is right for you and what fits in with your lifestyle. Because one of the most compelling things that we know, apart from the science of exercise, is that developing habits and to be active and to do exercise can be really hard to make part of your everyday life. We brush our teeth without thinking about it because it's a habit. You put the bin out on bin night because it's a habit. When you get out of the car, you close the door. There's lots of things we do that are part of our life that are simply habits. But it's hard for many of us, including myself, to make it a habit. And so therefore, one of the things we will often say is the best exercise for you is the one that you will do. So it's around what you can do, what you enjoy doing, what is practical for you. When we look towards developing this idea of a healthy lifestyle and exercise habits, we know it can be challenging for people who have disability. And it can be particularly, uh, we know that it's particularly important with people with MS who are not actively exercising when they go to start, how you might go around doing that. We see an emergence of the health coach and psychologists and health psychologists working with professionals to think about how we can start to build more sustainable habits rather than just doing a six week hit at a gym or paying for a gym and starting and then not going, but how do we actually build this into our lives so we can keep doing it? So the things that I think are important are to get advice from a health professional. If you're not active and you want to start, go and have a conversation with someone um, who knows you well about what you might do. It's important to start early. All of us need to be active, whether we have MS or not. If you're not active and you're recently diagnosed, starting activity is important. But it's important to start with small goals and to build up really carefully and gently, rather than going wild at the beginning. It's important to build a support team around you. You need, you need a crew who will help you keep on track. You might have someone that you exercise with. You might have someone who touches base with you. You might build in a coffee after your exercise or someone to go walking with. One of the most important things I see from people who have neurological conditions who've managed to do this well is that they're really good planners. They will sit and they'll look at their week and they'll think, well, how am I going to get my activity in? Okay, well, I won't drive to work every week. Maybe on Thursday I'll catch the train, I'll walk this way. Rather than thinking it will just happen, it's a matter of really carefully structuring in your week when this will happen and planning ahead. It's important also to think about where you can cheat and get a little bit of activity as part of your everyday life. 
So maybe you're going to walk the kids to school one day. Maybe you'll park your car further away a different day. There's all sorts of things that you can do as part of your lifestyle and that's the most successful thing. It just becomes part of what you do rather than something extra. As well as doing particular formal exercise, it's really important to try things and find what you like. It needs to be fun or it needs to be functional. That is, it helps you as part of your everyday life. It's just part of what you do. It's also important to keep track of your exercise and your goals, to keep track of what you're doing. It's easy for these things to slip away. And living with MS is challenging and life will intervene for many people. So if you have a relapse or your gym closes or you get sick or somebody you know gets sick or something happens and you lose your habit, you need to start again. So again, we work with people. It's realistic that life happens and sometimes we stop, but it's what skills have you got to start again? How are you at getting back on the wagon and getting going again? And how might you know how to do that? We know that for people exercising with MS, there are particular considerations and there's a lot of information available about that. We know that choosing what time you exercise can be important choosing perhaps a cooler environment, having hydration, knowing how exercise might impact on your fatigue and having strategies to slowly monitor your, your exercise. There are things like overheated pools we think might be good to avoid. But often if you enjoy walking, it can be hard to do when it's raining and it can be hard to do when it's hot. Things like walking groups at lots of the major shopping centres in Melbourne have walking groups that meet weekly at 8 o'clock in the morning and they go walking through the indoor shopping centre in the cool environment without all the congested kids and round about the time you finish exercising, it's coffee time. So there's ways and means if you plan ahead to, to, to deal with these barriers, these things about what makes it harder. A recent thing that we've become much more aware of, a part as well as being active, is actually sitting. So again, at a public health level for all of us, we know that even if we're very active, prolonged inactivity, sitting too long without moving, or lying too long without moving, poses an additional health risk, even if you're very active, and you're sitting all day in an office, we know that that's a concern for health. And, and you might see some media around the killer couches or um, sitting as the new smoking. Our lifestyles have changed. This is my life. <laughs> I travel to work in my car, I sit in my office, I go home and I sit in my couch. Um, and to relax, I look at things on my iPad. So we see lots of aspects of everyday life don't involve activity. Across the day, there are some little things that we can do just to, just to remind ourselves to get moving, to breaking up the activity. So if people are sitting for prolonged um, lengths of time, often even just setting an alarm to get up every hour or so, it can be a reminder. So this is me in my desk over at the University of Melbourne. It's not a particularly good photo, but it shows my standing desk. So I have a desk that will actually allow me to stand for part of the day. And for office workers now, we are suggesting probably a couple of hours in the mornings might be good to aim for, but it's very much to the individual level. That's probably the best thing I've done for my health um, over the last year. I take standing coffee breaks. You might have noticed I was actually standing at the back rather than, than sitting. And certainly if you go to a physical activity conference, you'll see lots of people standing. Standing up on the ad breaks. Standing perhaps to do the dishes rather than putting in, in the dishwasher. There are lots of little signals you can give yourself across the day to get up, walk around the house, even if it's a minute or two, there's indicators that that could be something helpful for your health. Technology can be helpful. We know that there are devices that are becoming uh, common. I've actually got a, a Fitbit on. I keep track of how many steps I've done. There's exergaming. We're starting to see 
apps that might help people do exercise or help them keep track of exercise. I have colleagues in America who are looking at developing virtual coaches and certainly there's lots of research around tele-rehabilitation. So bringing the health coach or the physio into your home to chat with you about your program, particularly when you get stuck or you hit a bump on the road. So we'll see a lot more in that space. So I guess my key message for people with MS is, is very much the key message for everyone within Australia, whether you have MS or not. We need to move more and we need to sit less. We need to increase physical activity across the landscape of our lives on a day-to-day -day basis and consider whether there is focused exercise that may be particularly useful for you. We also need to think about, can we break up some of those prolonged periods of inactive time that we have. So I'll finish at that and, and I'll leave you with the key message that is for all Australians, which nicely has an M and an S, which is to move more and sit less. Um, there are lots of resources. If you're not active and you want to start, please speak to your health professional. Uh, contact MS Connect and start a conversation about how you can slowly increase activity to make it part of your life. Thank you.